Hi, yeah, my name is Steve Berryman and I'm from Attestant. Uh, Attestant is a, an Ethereum only staking company. And what we're going to look at today is an alternative to liquid staking. Liquid staking has been phenomenally successful, phenomenally successful. And as with anything in the Ethereum ecosystem, something that becomes that successful becomes centralized and then becomes an issue. So we we at Attestant and been talking to some other staking companies, uh, try to come up with some other ideas around how to transfer validators from, um, from one owner to another without going through the exit queue. So really this is one idea that we've been floating around and we are looking for you know, other staking companies to, 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 to be part of this, building this out if, if, if we think it's a successful direction. So I've kept this quite light. In, in the way I want to go with this is, is, um, is to really give the justification for what we're trying to do. And the detail and getting into the weeds, really, I think, if you're interested, come and speak to us and, uh, and we can talk, talk through some of the detail. But it's really the rationale why we're doing this. So let's have some context around what, what is staking in the first place. What is staking in Ethereum? So. This is a very high level. Clearly, there's a lot of complication goes under underneath the hood of this for Ethereum staking. But in from a very high level in, in how we want to view this is uh, we're locking up funds, uh, 32 ETH. You send 32 ETH to the uh, deposit contract. This was that this started in December 2020. Uh, you sent your 32 ETH um, to the contract and that basically gave you a ticket onto the beacon chain. And that, that ticket enables you to build a validator and go through a certain number of steps and duties. And if you carry out them duties, you receive rewards. So some of the things you receive, receive rewards for are testing. That's the, uh, you're doing that every six minutes. It's the bulk of the rewards you receive. And if you're online and you're testing, you get a very small, uh, small amount. Anybody that's used the, the blockchain uh, website and has got a validator will see their, their rewards, rewards keep chipping in. Um, and proposing a block. Doesn't happen very often now. There's 7,200 blocks a day. There are 44,000 validators out there. So roughly every 62 days you'll get a block. But they were the only two uh, places to get rewards back in December 2020. Then we had the uh, Altair fork and that introduced sync committees. Sync committees are even rarer than blocks. Um, block proposals, you'll get one of these, I think, maybe now once every three years. But when you do, when they do turn up, you make a lot of money during that period. It's only for two days, so if you're offline then two days, it's uh, unfortunate. And then, of course, what we've seen with the merge. The merge, and this is really, everyone's excited because now we can, we, we're not only getting transaction fees, which used to go to the miners, but now we can spend it and we couldn't spend before. So this, you know, is exciting for the first time after almost two years of having money locked up. Finally, we've got some we can spend. And of course, MEV comes in here as well, you know, so that, that's, that's staking in a, in a nutshell, Ethereum. Okay, liquid staking. So briefly what liquid staking is, and it's hard really not to, um, really not mention Lido, because Lido is the biggest player clearly. And there's going to be try to be other players, but again, it's another centralizing force. So what is liquid staking and, and why do people go for this, this approach? Well, currently over 30% of the staking rewards go to Lido, and that's not great. But then again, Lido runs under different node operators, so it's not quite as centralized as you may feel. But still, you know, it's an ecosystem with lots of various different options. But why has this become so popular? Well, however easy, you know, some of us techies think it is to run a node, it's just not easy. And there are lots of complications, and you have to keep the thing updated. And, you know, a number of people I speak to go, well, it stopped working. Well, you know, you, you're just not committed enough in what's going on in the community. So it's difficult. It's difficult to stay on top of things. Um, and so, 
and, and, so, and so with that, people are going to want an easier solution to pick up some rewards. And of course, you've got slashing. I mean, you mentioned slashing to somebody and they go, and that's it, I'm not even going to touch, touch home staking. But being in the staking company, we always try to get people to stake at home. But I mean, you know, the technologies for most people is probably out of the reach and they've got to be want to do it. So when, you know, Lido came along, it's just a perfect, it's convenient, it's so simple. You just go and buy their token. You go and take your, you know, your ETH, you go and buy some uh, token, you, you've got two choices, you can go and mint it directly or you can go and buy, that, buy them for, on an exchange, Uniswap, and, and basically, you're there, that's it. You stick it into cold storage, you forget about it. Lido uses a rebased token, so your rewards go straight to your wallet. There's, there's no messing about, cost you 10%, but you haven't got to set up a box and you haven't got to worry about it. Um, so, so, and it's been you know, a phenomenal big success. But what's the downside to it? Well, one of the downsides is you lose control of your ether. Uh, however good Lido are, you are handing it over. You're handing over your ether to a pool of ether and you're getting effectively an IOU. Now, for individual small investors, less of an issue. For large institutions, this is a no-no. It won't get past the compliance department. There's also some other issues which are very interesting, regulatory issues. Um, you're in a pool, the pool gets tainted with tornado cash, it comes tricky. Um, so people don't want to necessarily, large institutions don't want to be involved in, in a pool system. And of course there is a tax thing in some jurisdictions going from one token to another can be seen as a, a disposal and a taxable event. Um, so that is something that I think probably a lot of Lido users probably don't realise that many jurisdictions put that as a, as a taxable event. Okay, so, so, so what is an, uh, an alternative approach? We've been throwing this idea around for, for a while, but the thing is, is, you know, there was this little thing called the merge that sort of kept us busy for a while. But now that we're sort of over that and, you know, it is, I think Danny said, you know, it was uneventful, which was, for a staking company, that's what you want, uneventful. So now some of these things come back on the radar. And also they do require some extra changes to the EVM in order for some of this stuff to work. But our idea is that we make validators transferable so that they can change ownership. Now, when I say transferable, I'm not talking changing staking company. The, the, the validator will stay with the same staking company but you can transfer the ownership to somebody else. And um, at the moment, the way validators work, you have a validator key, and that's the thing you have online to create your rewards, and you have a withdrawal key. The withdrawal key is just a regular Ethereum, or in fact, it can be an Ethereum one address, or it can be a BLS address. But once the merge, once the, um, once we get past to the withdrawals, so I didn't mean to go past, um, and get to withdrawals, this thing doesn't have to be just a withdrawal key. It can actually be a smart contract. And we've already got a, a smart contract that handles this sort of thing very well, NFTs. So we could use an NFT smart contract which issues a receipt to the, to the validator. And now the validator is transferable. It can be moved around. And it's also an NFT that's actually valued something. It's not you know, it's not a JPEG underneath. It has actually got 32 ETH under it. So, so this idea, um, once, you've got, once we create this smart contract, then we've got a lot more flexibility. And it's, in one way, it's not up to us to decide what the market does with this. It's just quite interesting to put the great thing with DeFi, you put stuff out there and see what happens. But, uh, you know, I've got a, a couple of my own use cases where I think this would be particularly useful. For example, you've got uh, a large institution wants to buy a thousand validators and somebody wants to sell a thousand validators. Now, you can off-board it. It takes at least 15 to 24 hours if there's no queue, or, and you then somebody else on-boards. It's quite heavy on the network as well for Ethereum to do that. And also, both sides are losing accrued interest. So if you think of this as a bond, you know, you're losing money for, for the 24 hours, and if there's a queue, it could be a lot longer. So wouldn't it be more convenient if there was a marketplace where two people just bought the validators off each other? There's instant settlement. Uh, the Ethereum network handles it extremely well. It's just a transfer. 
Um, we've still got the same validators running. Uh, and, you know, the, it just becomes a, a, a much easier way of large institutions to be able to buy and sell. I mean, clearly the marketplace has got to have liquidity to do this, but you could imagine you're just about to get rid of a thousand validators, you would go to the marketplace first. If there's a liquidity, you're going to get a better price or you're likely to get a better price than just unwinding it because you're going to lose a day's worth of interest and rewards. Um, some other stuff you could do with a receipt, and I don't know if this is an advantage or disadvantage, I'll, I'll let you decide, but it could be used as collateral in DeFi. So all them wonderful things. And the great thing with this, it comes with a revenue stream. So anybody who's into financial engineering could come up with many different views of ways this could be used. Uh, and it could be very interesting. Um, and I think a marketplace where buyers and sellers can come together, I think would be very interesting. Um, and as I say, it's for the network, for the Ethereum network, it's also better not having these ether, huge amounts of ether coming in and out of the system. And, and you know, why wouldn't this, why wouldn't this be the be better way of transferring and providing liquidity to staking assets without, you know, without going through the, uh, the, the on and off boarding. Okay, so what are the benefits? I mean, the biggest one is you still own the ether. It's, it is a receipt. You still own it. It's yours. It's not pulled. Okay, so it means decentralization because, you know, we, we're, you know, people are not pulling this thing into LIBO or into another pooling system. So, um, and the other thing with this is something as a staking company we think about. If you're a good staking company in LIDO or you're a bad staking company, nobody cares because all the rewards are just mixed. With this, we start to find out who are the better ones because the marketplace can monitor it. The marketplace can, can, do, uh, can look at all the stats for all the different uh, validators. And clearly, we think that's a good idea. And uh, it's something that also, if you think of these things as starting to look very much like bonds, credit spread could actually be, these are like credit spreads. So the, the, staking, uh, the staking companies become credit spreads. And I think that would be quite an interesting marketplace. I think this is also the vanilla vision we've got, but I could imagine we could take a, a step further on a lot of this stuff and we could build insurance, we could build fees, we could be a lot more, because now it's a smart contract, so everything's up for grabs really. So why hasn't this already been done? The obvious question. Can't do it, or we can't do it easily. We can't do it easily. The biggest problem is that we've had the merge, and. So what's the problem? These two things are now talk to each other, but they don't, they don't. We, we did the minimum to get the merge over the line. And so at the moment, the EVM can't talk to the beacon chain. So we've got no way of being able to test the state and test you actually own that validator. So there is actually an EIP, which is, is aiming for Shanghai, which is the 4788. And what this does is produces an opcode for the EVM, which allows you to see the beacon route, the state route. And what does this able to do? You can build a Merkle proof and you can prove the validator is yours and then you build the NFT. So it just needs this little bit of glue and then we're away. And hopefully this will get included into that uh, Shanghai and we will be testing some ideas around this. Yeah, so, so really that's the main thing of this not being done is just we're, we're waiting for the next, the, the next thing for to, the, you know, this, this EIP to come through. Hopefully in the next... Uh, hopefully in, in the next round of updates. Right, potential issues, there's always gonna be some. Um, you know, it's the same thing as the advantages, it can be used in DeFi, you know. And you know, we, we see, we've seen the good and bad of that, so just be wary of it. Um, and we could have bugs, it's a smart contract. You know, we've seen a few of them as well in the last few years. I think with the bugs thing though, this stuff is using the standard technology. We're using an NFT contract. We're not, doing any, we're not putting any innovation in new stuff. We are gluing it together differently. So clearly, lots of audit very around that. But we're not going out and building some new smart contract. We're, we, we're using technology that we've all been using for the two or three years. Right. And that is the end of my talk. As I say, it was quite lightweight to give you a rationale of why, we, of why we're looking into this. Um, if people want to get into the weeds, please come and contact me. We, um, 
you know, we're, we're looking for getting more staking companies involved. This thing only really works if other staking companies. It's a network effect. You know, it's, if it's just a test, then it's not going to work. So, so clearly we need other people involved to build the tools out to, to make this, you know, if, if, if the community thinks something like this is, is a, an alternative, and even if it takes a small percentage from people using Lido, that's going to help the uh, decentralization. And I think I've... Thank you, Steve. We have four, five minutes more, so maybe a question from the sure, audience. Sure, yeah. So here. Um, thanks for the presentation. So you mentioned that um, the staking, uh, liquid staking tokens are subject to attacks. Here we are also like receiving a receipt. That receipt will include some yield, right, for staking rewards. So yeah. I think it's the same disadvantage here, correct? You mean from the tax point of view? Right. So it could be. I mean, it does depend on jurisdiction because you could argue, and you know, we're, I'm not a t I know much about tax, but you could argue that a receipt is different from a token transfer. You know, it, it's, you, all you're doing it is like a receipt for goods. I know the UK government doesn't do that, so I know you're right in that fact, but there is a lot of debate going on about it. But really, there has not been a transfer of assets, so that would be the thing I would like tax authorities to look at to go, look, you've just got a receipt, you still own these assets. Right. But it, you're right in that it's, uh, it's messy, it's a messy, it's a messy field. And as for the collateral, I mean, that sounds messy, right? Because, as well, because uh, collateralizing NFTs I mean, NFTs are non-fungible by definition. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like using I mean, NFT as a collateral for a DeFi. I mean, it is already done. So, and I'm not suggesting this is a good idea. It's already done. We've seen there are many platforms already doing this, and you know, it's not it's not for us to try and decide where the market takes this stuff. It's it's just the point that you can use it for collateral, and I'm sure somebody will do that. So. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the talk. It was great. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this may be a silly question, but um, I'm going to take the chance right. to embarrass myself. So validators, don't they run with hardware? Um, is that a thing? So how, how are you then going to kind of transfer the hardware with the NFT? Right. So I didn't go too much into that, but it is, it is a good question because um, there's a certain assumption I'd made in, in the presentation. Th this would be done by staking companies. Okay, so we, as intestant, we would still be running it. So it's not transferring from the point of a staking company. So if, you're, if you've got a validator, you're still, and it's with us, you're staking with a testant, you're just selling it to somebody else. So, and a testant is still doing its job. So the, the hardware and all that stuff doesn't stay. I mean, a validator is basically made up of two keys. A validator key, which is what a testant hold and then the withdrawal key which the client holds so you know all you're really doing is is changing the ownership but what we're not doing is changing the people that are doing the validating have you all thought about what this looks like with shared operators inside of the nfts so it's not just one staking company but it's a collection of people running together um i've not really i've i personally not really thought about that we've kept it very very simple in a way of you know providing some liquidity to clients who would need it this is where this has really come from and you know it's just a way of taking the pressure off the network that you know it, it seems silly to me that we've got a lot of validators coming in and a lot of validators leaving and really it's one big organization wants wants to buy it and another big organization wants to buy it so it seems a natural way to do this i mean there are also some other things that like you, you may you know, one institution may have all their staking with one company and another institution has all their staking with another company. And I could imagine for risk management, they may actually swap some of their validators over to split the risk. So, you know, I'm sort of making up use cases, but this is the sort of thing that once you've got a marketplace then, then, and it's liquid enough, I think people would probably use that sort of facility. Uh, so you mentioned Lido. I'm curious if you think there are ways to synergize with existing like pooled staking uh, derivative projects um, or if like if you have any thoughts in that direction I mean definitely we, we talk a lot with Lido I mean um, we, we write a, a, a software stack called Vouch if any of you are familiar with but Vouch 22% of the Lido operators use Vouch so the, we, there is constant communication and with these guys um, 
whether they will get involved in certain things. But certainly Lido don't want to be 40% of the network, I can tell you that. So it's in their interest to have um, you know, options that work to, to, to spread the load. So you know, we talk to them about various different things. So they will certainly be in the conversation. Uh, you could do, again, I think, let the market decide, all right? Because, you know, you could, would it make sense to do many things with this stuff? I think, I think being able to transfer ownership is the big use case for, for my thinking. But, you know, there, I can imagine there'd be lots of funky project uh, products built off the back of it. So, you know, I was, I was somebody involved. I was, I was a, thank you. Thank you so much.